So in this video, I want to talk about the treatment of asthma. Asthma is a chronic lung disease that narrows and inflames the airway. So if we want to think about treatment, obviously, we will come up with bronchodilators to prevent bronchoconstriction and obviously also anti-inflammatory drugs to do something about the chronic inflammation of the airways. So our two target cells are going to be the bronchial smooth muscle cell and an inflammatory cell. And I've just drawn here as an example the mast cell, but it could be any other inflammatory cell as well. So let's look first at the bronchial smooth muscle cell. There are several receptors, G-protein coupled receptors on the cell that mediate either relaxation or contraction. So if you want to use now any drugs that help us as bronchodilators, we could either stimulate receptors that mediate relaxation of the bronchial smooth muscle cells, or we try to block the contraction of the bronchial smooth muscle cell. The only class of drugs that directly mediate bronchodilators dilation are better two agonists. They all end in terol, so like albuterol or sametarol. They directly mediate smooth muscle relaxation, and therefore these are the first-line drugs also for an acute asthma exacerbation. Because obviously it's more helpful for the patient to directly stimulate relaxation rather than to prevent bronchoconstriction. Therefore these are going to be our first-line medications for asthma in general. As you can see here, there are several receptors that mediate bronchoconstriction, and therefore we can prevent bronchoconstriction by blocking these receptors. One example are muscarinic antagonists. So there are M3 receptors on the bronchial smooth muscle cell that mediate bronchoconstriction, and therefore we can block these with tyotropium or ipratropium. Yeah, they have the tropy in their name, atropine, so it should remember us about an muscarinic antagonist. We also could use antagonists to the leukotriene receptors. These are the leukast, like Montelukast or Saphiroleukast. They all end in leukast. Another possibility is theophylline. Theophylline is an antagonist at the adenosine receptor, which is GI coupled and also mediates bronchial smooth muscle contraction. Remember that theophylline is not only an adenosine antagonist, it's also a PDE inhibitor. Therefore, it's also going to prevent the, the degradation of cyclic AMP, and therefore increased levels of cyclic AMP are also going to mediate smooth muscle relaxation. Let's look at our other target, the inflammatory cell. Remember, asthma is a chronic inflammatory disorder. Therefore, we should also do something about the inflammation and target inflammatory cells like the mast cell. I use the mast cell here as an example because it plays a major role in the pathophysiology of asthma. And remember, mast cells have histamine preformed in their granules, so once they degranulate, there's going to be the release of histamine, there's also going to be more leukotrienes, and both of them are triggering inflammation as well as bronchoconstriction, what we're going to see in another slide. So how can we decrease this inflammatory response? So the most potent anti-inflammatory drugs are the glucocorticoids. And the glucocorticoids have as a target the glucocorticoid receptor or nuclear receptor that, that can affect gene transcription. Once you have glucocorticoids on board, there's going to be less production of pro-inflammatory cytokines, other inflammatory mediators like prostaglandins or leukotrienes. So what are other options to stabilize the mast cell or to prevent the degranulation of the mast cell? So once we have a stimulus, the mast cell can degranulate and produce a lot of histamines and leukotrienes. What are these stimuli? Well, the stimuli could be allergens. Allergens can lead to the production of IgE. Once IgE bind to their respective receptor, the FC epsilon receptor, they can cross-link, and this cross-linking of IgEs can lead to the degranulation of mast cells. So we have drugs that prevent IgE from binding to the FC epsilon receptor. And these are IgE antibodies, so anti-IgE um, drugs. 
there's only one on the market that is omalizumab and this binds to IgE, a monoclonal antibody, and therefore the IgE is less likely to bind to the FC epsilon receptor and therefore there is less decrenylation, less production of histamines and less production of leukotrienes. Besides allergens, there are lots of other stimuli that can lead to mast cell degranulation. For example, cold, smoke. What happens if there's any of these stimuli? There's an enzyme going to be activated which is called phospholipase A2. What phospholipase A2 does, it, it just cuts out of these phospholipids that are in any cell membrane arachidonic acid. Arachidonic acid can give rise to leukotrienes or prostaglandins via the enzymes LOX, lipoxygenase, and COX, cyclooxygenase. So we have one drug that particularly targets lipoxygenase, and this is siluton. So what's going to happen is you block this enzyme and therefore you're going to have less of these leukotrienes. So these leukotrienes are potent inflammatory mediators. But that's not the whole story. Please remember that leukotrienes are also potent bronchoconstrictors and you can see here their effect on the bronchial smooth muscle cell because we have here leukotriene receptors that can mediate smooth muscle contraction. Also histamines can lead to smooth muscle contraction. Please remember that we don't use antihistamines for asthma treatment. It would make sense based on this picture here. However, it turns out that those drugs are not efficacious in the treatment of asthma. Probably it's just that there are so many mediators involved that if you just block histamine, that doesn't make a huge difference. So I put here some other stuff in this overview picture. And so one is, if we stay here at this arachidonic acid that gives rise to leukotrienes and prostaglandins, one thing that I wanted to mention is that you have probably heard about NSAID-induced asthma. And so the idea is if somebody is on NSAID treatment like aspirin, what's happening is that you're blocking this pathway here, and therefore you're going to shunt over arachidonic acid to the LOX pathway, so you're going to produce more leukotrienes, and these mediate inflammation and bronchoconstriction, and therefore NSAID can be responsible for exacerbating asthma. I also put in here glucocorticoids because they increase the synthesis of annexins, which are going to inhibit phospholipase A2. So glucocorticoids also particularly decrease the production of arachidonic acid. You're going to get less leukotrienes and less prostaglandins. There's one other drug that we use to treat asthma, which doesn't have a direct target, so it's hard to draw into this picture. However, it basically just stabilizes the mast cell, is the drug chromolin. We don't know how that works, but for some reason, if you have chromolin around, there is less mast cell degranulation, so you stabilize the mast cell. So I just want to finish up this video with the treatment guidelines for asthma. So generally, we use a stepwise approach to asthma. So you can see the several steps in terms of severity of asthma treatment. And generally, we, we distinguish between intermittent asthma and persistent asthma. So intermittent asthma is defined that you have less than twice a week symptoms. Then persistent asthma continues with either mild, moderate, or severe. So for the mild one, you have more than twice a week symptoms, but not daily. Then for the moderate persistent asthma, you have daily symptoms, but not throughout the day. And then for the severe persistent asthma, you have symptoms throughout the day. We have two more steps. We step five and step six asthma, which is just more severe than the severe persistent asthma. So let's look at our treatment. So generally, you always start with a short-acting beta agonist called a Saba, which would be albuterol, and you just take it as needed, as long as you don't need it more than twice a week. This is okay. But then if you are going to have persistent asthma, you need some anti-inflammatory component in the drug regimen. And so generally, you would start with an inhaled corticosteroid, ICS, inhaled corticosteroid, with a low dose. Then 
the next step would be you're going to add a long-acting beta agonist. So you need something more long-term for bronchodilation, so a long-acting beta agonist. Then you can just go up the dose for the inhaled corticosteroid. You use medium dose and then high dose. And for this very severe asthma steps five and six, you can then add as the latest step also an oral corticosteroid. And generally, if there's an allergic component, you could consider omalizumab. This was our IgE antibody. I just want to also mention some alternatives. So if the patient does not want to take an inhaled corticosteroid, there are three alternatives. Number one is actually Lucas. So the leukotriene receptor antagonist, you could use that, or the chromolin. This is a mast cell stabilizator, or even theophylline, although that's not really recommended anymore. Then when we go up the persistent asthma moderate one, there is no way now anymore to get around the ICS in head corticosteroid. However, if you don't want to take a LABA, you could still use some other things. You could use Silutone, this was our LOX inhibitor, or the Lucas, or the Theophylline. Although again, Theophylline is still on the list, but it's not really preferred. The same is for our severe persistent asthma. We can also have some alternatives for the long-acting beta agonist. But again, it's very important to realize once you're in the moderate persistent asthma, there's no alternative for the corticosteroid treatment. For any stage, you can use a SAVA short-acting beta agonist as needed. And also remember, LABAs, long-acting beta agonists, are never used alone. There was one study that showed if you use LABAs alone in asthma patients, that leads to more asthma-related deaths. So now we always combine the LABAs with a corticosteroid. So again, this is just the guidelines for asthma treatment in adults. Kids is a little bit different. This concludes a video on the different treatment options of asthma.